Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Enter the Bible podcast, where you can get answers or at least reflections on everything you wanted to know about the Bible but were afraid to ask. I'm Katie Langston. And I'm Catherine Schifferdecker. And today we have as our guest Matt Skinner, Professor Matt Skinner. He's a professor of New Testament at uh, Luther Seminary, a longtime colleague uh, of ours. And uh, he is also the author of many books on the New Testament, one of the latest being uh, a book on the Gospel of Matthew called Matthew, the Gospel of Promised Blessings by Abingdon Press. So uh, check it out and all his uh, all his books. Uh, Matt, thank you for being with us. Thanks for being our guest on the podcast. Thanks for the invitation. So it's going to be fun. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So we have a question today from a listener. And as usual, uh, listeners, if you have questions that you'd like us to address, just go to enterthebible.org and, uh, and send it to us. So the question uh, that we're going to address today is uh, from a listener, again, and it says, uh, can you interpret flesh and spirit from a pro-body perspective, uh, with particular reference to the Apostle Paul? So uh, Paul, in various New Testament epistles, uh, uses this terminology of flesh and spirit, uh, particularly um, uh, two texts uh, that we're going to talk about in Galatians 5 and Romans 8. Uh, so just in Galatians 5, just to give you a taste of this, uh, it says, live by the Spirit, this is verse 16, live by the Spirit, I say, and do not gratify the desires of the flesh, for what the flesh desires is opposed to the Spirit, and what the Spirit desires is opposed to the flesh, for these are opposed to each other to prevent you from doing what you want. So, uh, Matt, uh, does Paul hate the body? Does he hate the, the flesh? The bodies does- are bad? What? Yeah. Yeah. Bodies are terrible, and we should all become our disembodied eternal souls? Uh, the short answer is no. Uh, I think Paul actually loves uh, human bodies. I think he just talks about them really differently than than how we do. And so our understanding of what it means to be embodied is is quite different from Paul's, and some of that makes sense because of our knowledge of, of biology and uh, in anthropology as well, uh, quite different from in the ancient world. But this is a really fun question. This is a deceptively difficult question uh, because questions about how Paul speaks about flesh, which is a term we see in this passage, which he often sets in juxtaposition to spirit, is really different from how talk, Paul talks about bodies as well. These are two different Greek words and Paul uses them in very distinctive ways and means different things by f- even flesh and body. Hmm. So there's a famous old theological dictionary from the previous century that I didn't look it up, but I believe the entry on body in Paul is like 75 pages of like this big fat <laughs> dictionary. And the one on flesh is like 50 pages long. Of this. <laughs> so, terrible. you know, how many episodes do you want to do? Is the short answer. <laughs> we'll be here all day, folks. <laughs> yeah. But let's start with flesh and spirit, I guess, and and kind of looking into this passage. But just if people are bored already, you know, there's obvious implications to this because of like what you were alluding to, um, you know, Katie at the beginning. Does Paul hate body? Should we all become disembodied? Is Christianity a flight from reality, or is it a kind of mystical escape from the physical world? And a really short answer to that, short answer to that for Paul is no. Like, Paul never tells people to flee existence. Paul never tells people to uh, like discipline themselves in kind of a harsh, ascetic way, you know, to hmm. deny yourself pleasure or something like that. He, he gets close in some ways. Paul appears to have been celibate. Uh, Paul does talk about a spiritual experience, but he has to be goaded into doing it. Most of the time, he's really concerned about everyday life and what you eat and what your household is like and these types of questions. So he's, he's kind of normal in those, re, in those ways. But the church has a horrible history of, of making people feel bad about their bodies or of telling people that if you desire something, it's probably sinful, which creates all sorts of problems with things like sexuality and diet and kind of image of one's body. It probably creates horrible issues when it comes to people who are are, are ailing or who are disabled, um, right? all sorts of, of bad theology that hits people literally right where they live in their bodies. So I don't know, I, sh- I should stop there. I haven't even talked about the text yet, but just to kind of, 
No, so I that's, think this, I think it's a very far reaching topic. Yeah, it's it it is as you said a, decept, a deceptively simple question, but it has really vast implications. For I, I remember a former student of ours who had experienced uh, some sexual violence uh, before, and said that what helped her was thinking, "I I am not my body; I have a body." And then she came to seminary and realized, you know what? That's not you know it's you can't divorce the two right that that our bodies are so much a part of who we are and really a healthier way of thinking about it is to think holistically and so the church has you're right the church has been uh harmful and some of some church teachings have been harmful in that way but uh but if you look to the the biblical text and particularly the old testament right there's there's lots of concern about bodies about human bodies animal bodies you know, soil, water, all of that. It really does, uh, it really is of concern, it seems to God. Well, and I also hate to break it to you, but the resurrection was a bodily experience as well. Exactly. So, right, 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 right. So, yeah. Yeah, and Paul's all over that in First Corinthians 15. Mm -hmm. so he's, mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. So flesh. Um, yeah. So flesh so is not body. Okay, that's, I didn't know that. That's so cool. So what, well, is, what yeah. is it then? Yeah. Well, they're not synonymous for Paul. How about that? Yeah, Flesh yeah, and body. Yeah. So um, theologians love wordplay, and especially Paul loves playing on multiple meanings of terms, which is probably really fun if you're talking to him. It's re probably really difficult if you're reading his letters 2,000 years later and you can't always <laughs> see the winks and, the, and, the, and things like that. So uh, sometimes Paul means flesh just to talk about literally the stuff we're made of. Like the term just kind of means meat. Uh, it's it's sarx in Greek, and it's often it's described neutrally. Paul will talk about things. He will talk about Christ descended from David according to the flesh, and what he means there is that Jesus is an actual physical descendant of David to be descended according to the flesh, right? In terms of bodies, but most of the time when Paul talks about flesh, he's talking about kind of a realm in which we live. In opposition to the spirit, you can live in a fleshly realm or you can live in a spiritual realm. And spirit there, almost always in modern English translations, is capitalized. And that's a decision by editors who are saying, we think Paul is here talking about the Holy Spirit and not like a spiritual side of me. So Paul's talking about what life looks like when it's ruled by flesh and what life is like when it's ruled by the Holy Spirit. And there, flesh doesn't necessarily mean your your meat <laughs> your you know your your skeleton and your vessels and and your skin and stuff like that what it means is kind of the part of you that gets ruled by sin and so he'll talk about things and so we saw that in Romans 5 16 right live by the spirit and you won't gratify the desires of the flesh there he's not talking about bodily urges as much as he's talking about the part of you that sin still has colonized, right? That sin has hmm. sunk its roots into. So and then Galatians go on. 5. Right? Sorry, yeah. you said Romans 5, Galatians 5. Oh, sorry. Yeah, Galatians That's 5. Oh. And then he'll go on to talk about things like the works of the flesh that are all mm -hmm. these horrible things that people can do. Um, uh, anger, quarrels, dissensions, faction, un envy, drunkenness, you know, just kind of the, he's, this, the list of vices, right? He's just pulling out everything. Uh, and then by contrast, the fruit of the Spirit, the things that the mm. Spirit produces. So here's a life marked by sin versus a life marked by the Spirit's own work. Um, Love, joy, peace, also, patience. Sorry, just listing oh, some yeah. of the fruits of the Spirit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All the good stuff. Um, but if you go back to verse 13, he says this, you are called to freedom, brothers and sisters, only don't use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence. That's the New Revised Standard Version. But through love, become enslaved to one another. That word, that translation, self-indulgence, in the Greek is just the flesh, hmm. which is interesting. So a translator there has decided to, let's get rid of the metaphor of flesh and define it as self-indulgence. But read it again. Don't use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence. And even that word opportunity means something like like a beachhead, um, like a command post in like military descriptions or something like that. 
In other words, don't let your freedom be an opportunity for the flesh to gain a foothold or to establish mm. a beachhead. Mm. And so for Paul, the, the, the one's self is a place where sin and spirit are at war, like literally within ourselves. Does that make yeah, sense no, that there in sense. terms of what he's, yeah. what he's getting at? And we have to look at other passages to really establish that. But that's kind of the first thing I want to make sure that we that we know that Paul, it's kind of a sphere of existence. And Paul loves dualism. So you either exist in the, in the sarks, in this flesh, or you exist in the Holy Spirit. And even though you're saved, even though Jesus loves you and all of that, nevertheless, your flesh is still a place that's been colonized by sin and still is prone to desires that are contrary to the spirit's desires there's this little miniature battle taking place within each of us not an angel and a demon on each shoulder but this kind of way in which sin is about enslaving your flesh sin is about enslaving the Hmm. person who you are and the spirit is about liberating who you are and it's an ongoing skirmish so it's like we're just simultaneously saints and sinners oh There we go. Well, that's a very good Lutheran read. (laughs) So just to clarify, living by the Spirit does not mean living outside of the flesh or living, uh, as you said, uh, 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 you know, denying your body and and from everything, right? Living by the Spirit means a bodily existence, but being guided by things like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, et cetera. Correct. Not by jealousy and envy and such. It's not a kind of spiritual escapism. It's not a kind of pure spiritual whatever. Um, and, you know, there are mystic traditions in Christianity, and that has worked for some people. Um, but it's not, that's not what Paul's saying. He's not saying give up everything, deny all of your, <laughs> deny everything your body needs, right. punish yourself. It's not that at all. Okay. Good enough. Good to know. <laughs> Good, so well, stop doing that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it go it goes along. I mean that I, I remember um yeah, when I was in classes with both of you, you know, that that was something that really came out that that I took with me was just this especially from Paul um Matt like that in for Paul there is this sort of cosmic battle happening, right? Within the human person and within the cosmos right the the idea of uh you know uh, that we our war is with principalities and powers and and so there's sort of um there's uh um if i may use this word apocalyptic kind of you know battle happening uh all the time uh but in christ we know who is ultimately victorious but that doesn't mean that it's not still uh, going on right now in our in our daily uh, existence which i think from a kind of um you know scientific kind of <laughs> modern worldview that is a really that can be a really challenging thing to like believe you could be like okay but that seems really you know that seems that seems a little crazy to say that um, I think until you maybe take a minute to actually observe the world around us and observe if you take some time to actually observe what's going on in your own heart and your own mind and so on, then it, then it then at least for me it becomes more plausible. Like, oh, okay, that that, that those categories aren't the default categories of the way we understand the world, you know, um, necessarily in our default culture, but. Um, but when you observe it, it, to me, it makes more sense and, and actually rings true. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. I think when you talk to people who are in recovery, who have wrestled with addictions, when you talk to people who have lived through awful kinds of social upheavals like wars and civil wars where, where otherwise kind people all of a sudden are caught up in a kind of frenzy. And I mean, but also in more pedestrian things in the ways in which we all have ingrained habits of acting that are incredibly selfish or incredibly mm. um, destructive. And it's, but it makes a difference, I think. I think for Paul, sin is not a list of things you've done wrong from which you have to be forgiven. It's an enslavement from which you have to be delivered. 
And that's not popular language. And that's language that's complicated by in the United States with our own history. But it's Paul's language to describe what what the problem of humanity is. There's a force. He says elsewhere, control. right? What, what I want to do, I don't do. What I don't want to do, that's what I do. Right? And that is a kind of language of enslavement, of being captive to something. So so right. it's the gospel that liberates, uh, uh, what liberates us is the gospel. Yeah. Right, right. Which in some ways gets us to bodies when you're ready to go there. Yeah, bodies let's, yeah, let's yeah, do that. Please yeah, go I was ahead. about to yep. ask that, yeah. Um, so we can talk about that too. Like, So Paul also uses the expression body. So again, flesh and spirit. When Paul talks about the flesh, when he's not talking about like your ancestry or what it means to just be alive and you know have have sensory perceptions, Paul talks about flesh and spirit as these two states of existence, right, or things that are at war. Um, he'll quote w- w- if you want to stay Lutheran here with your saint and sinner thing. Uh, so Ernst Kesemann mm-hmm. was a German New Testament scholar who said for Paul, anthropology, right, what it means to be human is cosmology, like in a nutshell. In other words, the same kind of cosmic warfare that you talked about, Katie, takes place within each person's own self. Now, do I believe it? it's exactly like that? Maybe not. I think we can take Paul metaphorically in some ways, but to make sense of the metaphor, you have to dwell on the metaphor first, I think. And so that's that's helpful. So what's the solution for Paul then? He at times will talk about bodies, but he never uses the word body as like a standalone term. It's almost, or, or almost never. For Paul, it's usually the body of something. He'll talk about a, a, a body that's enslaved to sin. He'll talk about a body uh, in Christ or even the body of Christ. Mm. Romans chapter 12, 1 mm-hmm. Corinthians chapter 12, he'll talk about Christ's own body. And so for Paul, body is always like social, it's always mm-hmm. about being connected to something else. He doesn't talk about your body. He talks about being now caught up in a body of sinfulness. So um, I'll jump to Romans 6. Romans 6, verse 6. We know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be destroyed. And here he's not saying your body is sinful, like your body is this kind of house of sin that has to be purged or something like that. Rather, it's a body that's so deeply connected or associated with sin. And the solution to that is to be then incorporated into Christ's own body. Hmm. In other words, as in Paul's imagination, nobody has a body that exists solely just for themselves, right? Hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, And this really ties into the way in which other ancient Greek thinkers talked about bodies, that our bodies are porous, right? Things pass through them. Um, And in some ways, we recognize that now. We, I think during COVID, we recognize the way in which the air we breathe and the people we're in contact with have influence on our health. (laughs) Sure. But the ancients, yeah, recognize this, that But for them, it was less about molecules coming and going and the air you breathe. For them, it was more about a world full of all sorts of spiritual powers that are constantly trying to get influence over you. (laughs) Hmm. Hmm. They're constantly trying to bend you to their will, whether those are deities or whether that's a kind of sense of fate or whatever. And so nobody fully lives to themselves. And so a, a big mark of like kind of maturity or strength in the ancient world was to have a body that would not be influenced without one's consent or one's one's willingness. And so for Paul, it's like, of course, your body's always interacting with the world. It's always interacting with others. And your the, the movement of salvation is to get moved away from a body that's constantly being influenced by sin and to move to a body that's now claimed by Christ. Hmm. To use Paul's baptism language, a body that literally dies and is raised again, just like Christ and into Christ. So so for Paul, it's not, I don't think he has quite the same sense of embodiment and selfhood as we have, but there's a connection there, right? That what's a true pro-body perspective? Paul would probably say a body that's fully been made alive by Christ. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. 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 That's, Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. The distinction there? So and that's where you come the, into your true self and your true yeah. goodness, your true potential, once you've been not just liberated by Christ, but actually 
caught up into a participation with him. So body of Christ is a communal concept, right? Like it, you mentioned 1 Corinthians 12 and Romans 12. So so we're none of us are the body of Christ alone, right? We're body of Christ as a group. Is that fair to say? So is that true of the body of sin too? Like like you mentioned being influenced by evil forces or de- or deities in the Greek mindset. We're also influenced by by other bodies, right? Other people around us. Um, I think so. Although I think when Paul's talking about, it, he's mostly talking about the influence that sin has on you versus the influence that Christ has on you. Okay. Okay. At least okay. in chapter six. When I went to chapter twelve, when he says basically, and here in First Corinthians, we corporately, and there's that word uh-huh. corporate, which is body. Right. We corporately are the body of Christ. That do you want to know what Christ looks like in the world? You look at people who have been baptized into his death and his life. Do you know what I mean? And so but, Christ's yeah. body is still present in the world. Christ's body is still influencing the world through literally our bodies. That's really helpful. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Now, Paul never says like, therefore, go ahead and do whatever you want. But he does talk about freedom in ways where he says, yeah. you know, he says, eat whatever you want to eat. Right. Yeah. Um, he says, nothing's going to defile you. But he says, you know, if what you eat offends somebody, then restrain your freedom and, and work that out. But he's not, he's not a killjoy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know what I mean? He's not somebody who says, if you like it, it must be bad. And that's how he's been yeah. taken sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that's that how is... some people were raised, I know, right? Or if it's like, yeah. and not even necessarily like around bodies, but some people have been raised to think, well, if there's two career options in front of you and you really want to do one, that's probably the selfish choice. So you should pick the other one and be miserable. I mean, I've, I know people who have gone through those kinds of discernment processes. And it's like, <laughs> why, why would you not choose the joyful route? <laughs> yeah, right, 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 right. Yeah, the fruit of the spirit includes joy. <laughs> no. It does. I, so I'm curious, later in Romans, in Romans 12, uh, I appeal to you, Romans 12, 1, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, <laughs> holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Would you mind, uh, yeah, explicating that a bit? Yeah, well, you've got more kind of puns or wordplay, right? Like the idea of a living sacrifice is kind of funny because a sacrifice's job True. is to yeah. die. Yeah. Um, but so there's you something- one job. Exactly. <laughs> your one job is to be killed on this altar. Uh, right. So living sacrifice is just an interesting image or metaphor right away, right, right there. Yeah. Um, present your bodies. And so here the, it's the term body, which, which yes, it has to do with my physical self, but body is, body comes closer than flesh does to describing kind of the sum of who I am. What me, what we in the modern world might talk about as a self, for example, like, what does it mean that I'm a self? Part of that's embodied. I'd be a different person if I were inhabiting a different body, um, if I was a different body, but it has also to do with kind of my whole existence, my whole sense of who I am. And so I think for Paul, it's this idea of the acceptable response to what God has done for you is to give yourself fully over to God. Mm. Kind of love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind. Is that yeah, well, that's Similar. a good Old Testament. Yeah, <laughs> which, <laughs> I have to bring in the Old Testament, <laughs> which Jesus also liked. Yeah, uh, <laughs> and Paul also likes. I think it is like that, and and Paul puts it in at the end of that, which is your spiritual worship. That's how the NRSV has it, and if you look in the footnote, it says or reasonable. Hmm. The Greek word there is logikos, which we were get logic from. So it has a sense of this is your. Um, Logical is not quite right, but this is kind of the only fitting worship mm. that's imaginable based on everything Paul said in Romans 1 through 11, which is largely about our salvation in Christ. So how should one live is kind of what he's getting at in chapter 12. And he said, the way you live is to hand yourself entirely over to God. Now, one question then is, well, what does that mean for our bodies? And what does that mean for our sense of self-worth? I I think it's still really positive. But we've got, you know, Jesus says, take up your, you know, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. We have to also 
parse that very carefully. It's not just Paul. There's whenever it gets to be language of denying oneself or handing oneself over, we have to be really careful because our tendency is to say, yeah, I want you to do that. Mm. <laughs> I don't want you to do that for the sake of me, you know? And so there's some bodies or some people that we view as expendable. There are some people that we view as um, lacking the same worth that others do. And I think Paul would be mortified to hear us interpreting him in those directions. I hope. <laughs> wow, that so was that, awesome. So, Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Did, did uh, you have something else, Catherine? No, I, I just want to come back to your the the reasonable worship or the logical worship. Like you uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh in a sense Paul is saying this is actually what who you're created to be, right? Like you're not you're not denying your real self, you're actually coming into your real self, right? And your real identity and your full identity by uh, living according to the spirit. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I think so. I, I, I'm not, yeah. The, the one question is, does Paul have a sense of like living into one's full self or is that more of a modern concept? But we're modern, right, so right, right, right. let's talk about that because I don't want to go back and live in the first century um, at all. <laughs> Doesn't but, sound fun. Um, I think that is true, that this is not so much, a, it's not a loss of one's self. Right. It's a full discovery of one's self. Because again, for Paul, you're never... Which well, which sin has kind of corrupted, is that right? Like, Oh, yeah, yeah. Like you, you but, were talking earlier about uh, uh, the gospel, about Jesus liberating us from the body of sin. So it, I, I'm just trying to, I'm trying to express something, and I'm not, I'm probably not being so articulate, but you know, sometimes we think about like someone who's had a conversion experience about again, take up your cross and den deny yourself, and take up your cross and follow me. Like somehow we're denying our real self there, and Paul is saying, no, that's not actually your real self, right? You were created to to be part of the body of Christ. You were created to live in love and joy and peace and patience. And not envy and greed and sin. So in a sense, it's a turning back to uh, who we really are, who we're really created to be instead of uh, being enslaved to sin. Yeah, exactly. Right. And, and think of all the thin, things that sin does to, to deform or to malform a person. Right. Right. Yeah. And so it's meant to be this release from that. So Paul will talk about enslavement to sin you'll talk about being set free to Christ. He will use language of being enslaved to Christ, but more so the language is about being under sin to then being in Christ, which that's mm. subtle. I don't want to build a whole theology off of prepositions, but um, <laughs> we don't move from being under sin to being under Christ as if we're, we're being enslaved. We're, we're brought into this kind of new fullness of who we are. And how that plays itself out then, we have to, I think, I'm not sure Paul's going to give us all the answers to that, but Paul will say we're given gifts by the Holy Spirit <laughs> that are meant to build one another up, that love is the central yeah. connection, point of connection mm -hmm. between all of us. Mm -hmm. You can't love somebody if you're going to deny who they are. I, I, you know, it's This is part of what love is. And so to be brought into a body, into a community where that's expressed think has to involve what we would call a positive self-regard <laughs> mm -hmm. or a positive yeah. body image and all of that, that, that more modern language that I think is not, it, it, I'll say it positively. I think that's consistent with some of the things Paul's trying to get at. That's really helpful. Thank you, Matt. Thanks. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. Um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you to the listener who submitted that question, and especially thank you to those of you who are joining us on YouTube or uh, are listening in your favorite podcast app. Please remember that you can always go to enterthebible.org to get more wonderful reflections and podcasts, articles, commentaries, uh, um, overviews of every book of the Bible and more. Uh, and uh, if you enjoyed this program today, we invite you to please uh, review, rate and review us on uh, Apple uh, or like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And of course, the best compliment you can give is to share this podcast with a friend. Until next time. <laughs>